and he had built such a legacy with the guys like Arnold and Franco Colombo and Lou Ferrigno and all these original guys that they were like, Joe, you need to build a new one. And he did, and that's where World Gym came from. So 45 years ago this summer, World Gym was born. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today is a 25-year health and fitness industry veteran who sits at the helm of one of the largest big box gym franchises. With 230 locations in 15 countries and over 1 million members, he's responsible for taking the brand into the future whilst remaining true to the brand's history and identity. In our interview, we hear about the origins of the fitness industry and how bodybuilding and Hollywood movies shaped the health clubs of today. Why does traditional gym design need to evolve and what changes are likely to happen over the next few years? And what can regular big box gyms learn from the boutique studio experience? So please welcome the COO of the legendary World Gym, Mr. Jared Siracco, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Jared, thank you for inviting me to your wonderful suite here ah, in uh, Los Angeles. Nice thing. I wish I could say it was mine, but I, uh, I appreciate you guys coming and having me on. Very yeah. humbled to be here. So thank you. So you're in the, is it, I guess this is kind of the home of World Gym, isn't it? Yeah, that's kind of why I'm here, actually. It's our 45th anniversary, and we're here to do some homework on our 2021 convention. So uh, born right out here, just a few miles from this exact location. Yeah, so I was going to I was gonna test you a little bit, because I, I, as I prepared for the interview, I thought I'd learn a bit about World Gym. And it's got, it's got quite an interesting history, hasn't it? I hope I pass, but yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, hit me. So, so well, well, tell us a little bit about um, kind of how it started because there was, a, there was an interesting story about, I, I didn't realize the connection between Joe Gold, like Gold's Gym mm-hmm. and World Gym. So, you know, tell us that and I'll see if I know more than, well, if yeah. Wikipedia is as good as, as your knowledge. We will grab technology <laughs> and, and figure it out. Um, yeah, a great history, a great man that started, really a lot of people view him as like the, the father of fitness and the modern bodybuilding world and and whatnot, um, you know, from the early 1960s, he was really into that. And he was actually one of the innovators of fitness equipment, you know, and, and he had to build his own because there really weren't a lot of brands back then. There wasn't a lot of technology to set up gyms like there were. Uh, and yeah, he established the first brand based on his name. Uh, but then after a few years, and this is where it gets a little hairy and I don't want to speak out of turn, but uh, he, he had left that brand for a few years. and and. When he came back, he no longer owned the rights to it. And so he said, to you his know own, what? To his to, own To name. his own brand. Right. You know, he had heard that things weren't necessarily being run the way that he wanted them to be. And it had gotten away from the culture that he had created. Uh, and so he set out to build a new brand. And he had built such a legacy with the guys like Arnold and Franco Colombo and Lou Ferrigno and all these original guys that they were like, Joe, you need to build a new one. And he did, and that's where World Gym came from. So 45 years ago this summer, World Gym was born, and here we are. And it was, and I didn't realize that it was with, with the pumping iron and that, that was actually a World Gym that it was filmed in, wasn't it? No, I, I don't know. That's the, I was, it's so funny you say that, because the other day I was just re-watching it. Okay. Um, there was a lot in, in the Gold's Gyms right. originally, but there was a lot on, on Muscle Beach. Now you got to understand, Joe started Muscle Beach. Right. And so, you know, that whole outdoor workout thing is in our DNA. You know, it's been oh, really popular, right. you know, right now, especially the, the last year and a half. Uh, but that's part of who we are. Right. You know, and so, uh, he, yeah, he, there was a lot filmed there. And there's a lot, just it's filming. You can cut it up any way yeah. you want. So bits and pieces yeah. from around the world in different facilities. But. And it was interesting the bit because, I, I, you know, he, from what I read, he made his own dumbbells and... Um, mm-hmm. And apparently he was he was talented, as you said, in that sort of manufacturing fitness equipment uh, for for some of his early gyms. Yeah, I mean, when you think about somebody who's a visionary or an innovator, he really was one that you know doesn't get a lot of credit. You know, right. you, you hear about um, uh, Jack Lane, and you you hear about uh, some of these other guys like early on that did some things with fitness. Joe Weider, yeah. you know, some, some of these guys. Joe goes right up there with the legends who really made this industry be what it is today yeah. and uh, so it's nice to be able to talk about it yeah the, the other thing that i found interesting i think it was on your website but there was a guy talking about like in the original world gym where arnold was there and you know a whole whole list of kind of names that mm-hmm. dave draper and mm-hmm. frank zane and all that kind of thing there was a 
they were saying there was like a phone on the wall um, and nobody would ever answer it. And, and one of these guys that was a photographer used to pick it up and it was a lot of the movie um, production companies that wanted bodybuilders. And, and it was okay. They were like, look, we need six muscly guys for this. And, and if anyone was in the gym, they would just kind of like pull them together and, uh, and then send them off for these shoots. Um, so, I'd, so there's obviously a big, what, what I didn't realize is the, is the sort of like the, the start of the fitness industry and the influence of sort of Hollywood uh, and how those two kind of shaped, I suppose, a lot of the culture at the, at the time. Yeah. And just think about, I mean, when Arnold really made that transition, right from from on stage to on screen that was a big thing you know and and Lou Ferrigno same thing yeah. he, he was in you know the Hulk tv show and and to see those guys it just you know accelerated the growth of I want to be like that I want muscles like that I want to lift where how do they get there and that that really as it grew through the 80s and 90s I mean that became really a big culture and then part of it was they were literally on the world stage at that point yeah and right behind it was was our brand, yeah, which was great. Yeah, I, I, the more I learn about, and we've interviewed like people like Frank Zane and, and that kind of stuff, and um, you know, some, just so much seemed to originate from them, and um, and it, and yeah, was 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 kind of influenced. And I, I suppose it, you know, for and and it, you you can tell the same story in aerobics and and other kind of things. But I suppose it's like you know, for someone like you guys, been going for forty five years now. There's probably not many brands. Um, you know, outside of golds and maybe one or two that can actually say that they've been around for that long. Um, and I guess so in some ways it's almost like great, you know, that you've got that history. But it must be also quite challenging because, you know, things have also evolved a lot. So how does, you know, in your role, how, how do you kind of like combine that great history while staying relevant as a, as a brand today? Oh, it's funny you say that because I just came off of two two days of meetings talking a little bit about that, you know, shaping the new world gym as we move forward. But any great brand, any any great company over time has its different positions in its life cycle, right? And so you have to constantly take a look at it, evolve, grow, move, change, and adapt to survive. And it's been remarkable to see World Gym, which we really consider a legacy brand. 45 years is a long history. There's one, maybe two more, but, you know, just the, the one that preceded us, really, I think they're 55 years. But there's not many that exist like that and mm. have stood the test of time. And that's what I love about this. It's got such a rich history to pull from. But we've got a group of people right now that have our eyes on the future. And that's what I really love about it is throughout time, World Gym still tried to stay true to its roots, but over time kind of figure out how we can do that in a modern day era. Now, mm. I'm not saying they did it successfully for a long time. There were bumps and bruises along the way, uh, but it hasn't gone bankrupt and it hasn't mm. gone out of business. And it, you know, it may have changed ownership a few times, but the foundation of who we are and what we do, delivering serious fitness and making serious gyms that has stood the test of time. Mm. Is it still a family owned company? Yeah, yeah, it's owned by three brothers. And uh, they, they, they sit on the board now. They're not as much involved in the day-to-day, -day, but it's something they're very passionate about. And, and, you know, we look at that as part of our values, you know, in, in treating our franchisees and our gym owners as family. Hmm. So what's your view then, I, I guess, with your world gym hat on? Like, my guess is you would be described as a kind of a mid-market um, product box, or whatever you want to call it, but but and but I suppose over the last few years, certainly pre-pandemic, you know, there was a rise of a low-cost boutique, which I know you guys kind of had had sort of looked at. How I suppose, how do you look at all those different parts of the market? Why have you guys chosen where you are, and and how do you see those other bits playing in 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 your future? Well, one of the things about me, you're going to get full disclosure and full on transparency, right? Um, so. I'll be honest, it's all over the place, which is why I'm in the chair right now. Uh, because at some point, the, you know, that identity got muddied a little bit as far as price point. You know, those low-cost competitors came in, and um, they, they started to change the market. And honestly, I don't know if you know this or not. At one point, Planet Fitness bought World Gym. Mm, so, so you had the home of the... No gym intimidation and lunk alarm, no big numbers. And you had the founder of Modern Bodybuilding, 
right? Who, who depicted that exact person in their mind and they became one brand. When and that was, that was, that was uh, early 2000s. I think it was 2007, 2008. Don't quote me on that, but in that, in that area, um, you know, Joe Gold had died in 2004 and, you know, the, the brand was turned over to Mike Uritz. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mike, but he's, he's a great, great one to, to talk to as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, Planet and, and World were married for a very short time. Uh, it's probably like one of those Vegas marriages. It, it, it ends after a, a short period. How long were they, were they together then? Less than two years, okay. I think. And what was the re- what, do, you, do you know what the reason was for that? Well, I think for Planet, it was a growth acquisition. I obviously can't speak for them and, mm. and what was there, and I wasn't with the company at the time, but I believe it was, hey, let's acquire this group and turn them all into Planet Fitnesses. Right. And I think at that stage, I think a lot of the owners of World Gym said, oh, my God, these guys are coming to a town near me. we got to cut our price. Mm-hmm. And I hate that. I, I hate the race to the bottom. I think there's a place in the market for those value brands. Um, I don't want to be that. Why is that? And why don't you like that? I think the way that we're going to position World Gym and moving forward, there's value in what we offer. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be very clear to the consumer that when you pay a little bit more, you definitely get a better experience. And so people aren't afraid to pay for a better experience. You just have to learn to tell that story and create that value. Mm. And that's where we have a lot of work to do is, you know, training our people and coaching them up, so to speak, uh, so that we can, we can not only show a great gym, but deliver that great experience as well. Mm. So what do you think, like you've been around in the industry a lot longer than what I have, you know, and, and being involved and seeing other businesses as well. What, what do you think now really is, is, are those key things that people do want? I, I know there, there's definitely a place I, you know, we had Planet Fitness on here and, you know, they're, they seem to be going after a, almost like a, a, a blue ocean where no one's going after, which is great, you know, then they seem to be doing a great job at that. But in terms of, you know, what, where you're sitting from. Are you looking for the people that are probably more fitness savvy? And, and if so, what, what do you think people want nowadays, you know, like today? You know, it's funny. Our industry has gone through transition too, right? When we talk about early on bodybuilding and then at a certain point, people were afraid to even use the word gym. In the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was like, you couldn't say gym. It was too intimidating. You had to say health and fitness center. Or well, And it was like, man, like, where did that go? What happened there? You know? um, but the gym is back. <laughs> the gym is cool. You know, people, people are like, oh, I'm going to the gym. And you don't hear anybody say, I'm going to go to the health and fitness center today. <laughs> right? They don't say it. They don't post that. It's not a health and fitness selfie. It's a gym <laughs> selfie. Right? And, and so that culture has shifted again to the gym is cool. Um, and I think that creating environments and experiences that really resonate and touch the right market will help launch our brand again into the future. And that's what we're really looking forward to doing is, is taking what was so foundationally cool from so long ago and building upon that legacy and creating that modern day vibe. And people will pay for a better experience. Why do they pay for front row tickets at a concert? And how expensive our front row tickets compared to the bleacher seats. Mm. Why? It's a better experience. It's the same thing. Why do people buy, uh, you know, an iPhone or a high-end Android or whatever? They want a certain level of experience. I can get a cheaper phone. I can pick up the, the landline and make a phone call. But what is it about that product that costs them $800, $1,000 that they're willing to pay for? It's the user experience. It's the same thing in the gym. You have to make sure that you deliver the right kind of value. Don't overprice yourself and don't undersell yourself. Don't sell yourself short. So that's a strategy, and I think everybody should take a look at where they are in the marketplace and say, how much is delivering great fitness value or how, a great fitness service worth? Hmm. We, we have the best jobs in the world, man. I mean, just think about, you know, we were talking about this earlier. With the COVID situation, you know, the best defense is having a great health and fitness routine, right? Oh, we're taking care of your body. We're the best investment anybody can make. So why cheapen the product that we sell? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those gyms because they've done a great job of finding their position in the market. You know, fitness, high-end fitness, mid-tier fitness, some people can't afford it, and that's well, certainly understandable. But I feel as though that there is a real value in what we deliver, and I don't want to cheapen the product and the service 
that takes care of the most important investment any one of us will ever have. Do you think some of that in terms of your brand has, is, is it kind of demographic specific, you know, so is it leaning more to a kind of younger audience or, or how do you look at those, at that from an audience perspective in terms of, you know, how you're resonating and communicating? Well, that's a great question because we've been looking at our, our demographics recently too. The, there's a really strong demographic of 55 plus because they grew up with the brand. Mm-hmm. In 1976, they mm-hmm. were like, they're seeing Muscle Beach, they're Joe Gold and Arnold and Lou. They're still connected to those guys and they see World Gym and they automatically think of their younger days and their childhood and they, and they, they connect with the brand. It's amazing. Um, it's interesting to start to see that younger generation some of them, and this is partly our fault, and I'm not afraid to admit that as a brand because we're working on it, but you know, they don't really know who World Gym is. Mm-hmm. But if you say, oh, that's where Arnold and Lou and those guys, they all know who they are. You know, they may not watch their shows or be as, as that, but they, oh, that's where Arnold started? It's so funny. Even people who aren't in the bodybuilding, they know who he is. Mm-hmm. They know what he's known for. And so they automatically go, oh, that's cool. This must be a good place. So you... While they're not as connected to it emotionally, they are starting to understand that, hey, this is a, this is a place I need to be because I can get a serious workout in. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. One of the things uh, I, that struck me here, and I'm, I'm not saying it's exclusively here in California, but if you look at you know the st- younger people, the influencers, and the type of gyms that people that are, are you know popular and relevant on social media go to, it, it's it's very funny. You know, you would use this word gym, but it's almost like gone full circle. It's like the gym I used to go back in back in the day, like in the mid 80s um it's very similar and um you know is, interesting is is that a trend that's almost like coming back um that's why i asked about the demographic because certainly in in southern california you've, you've got a lot of those very well-known gyms or personal training studios where and i'm not agreeing with it but you've got you know people in there with cameras and this almost reminds you of when you look at the pictures of this sort of you know the arnold schwarzenegger where you've, you've got the same thing going on so i, ju- I just wondered if you've seen that as a trend where you know people you know aesthetics are kind of important again um you know if you look at gymshark as a as a fitness brand you know yeah. look at their imagery it's very much about they're not overinflated bodies but it's very much about a body isn't it and uh so what, what what's your thoughts on that as a kind of a, a of a trend <laughs> I, I listen it's funny because you see the phones now in, in, the, in the world of social media. It's like, I wish people would pay more attention to working out <laughs> in the gym, right, sometimes than, than making it, you know, attractive to others how they're working out or how they look working out, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you see now some people before they even get on a machine or do a set in a way, they got to set up the camera and they got to position the phone and I got to, and does it look good? It's like, you got this whole setup here and some of them are doing that in the gym. And they're not professional influencers either. They're just aspiring <laughs> to be, right? So it's, it's like, what well, everybody's become a fitness pro and everybody's become a fitness model and everybody's become a videographer. And that can get a little bit annoying. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, what it's doing for our industry is a good thing. Mm. It's, it's getting people involved in health and fitness at a younger age. And that's important to all of us. If you're a parent, you want your kids to be active. How are they influenced? Right now, they're influenced by the internet, by social media. You know, they see their athletes or actors or people that, and they see them working out because now that's cool. How many actors and actresses you see doing their routine? I got in shape for this movie. I did that. And it's starting to cause them to at least get to the gym. And to me, that's a win. Mm. The more people we can put there, however we put them there, is going to be a huge win for humanity. Mm. And so while I have issues with how it's done sometimes, 
um, if it, if it's helping our, po- our, our you know our population get stronger, healthier, fitter, and we can start them at a younger age, I'm good with that. Mm. I just think that there should be a little bit more lifting and working out than than uh, actual filming. Yeah. Know, from time to time. But even equipment now, they've got cell phone holders, yeah. right? And they and they designed it so that you didn't lose your cell phone or that you could put a workout on it, but it's being used as a tripod for, for people to, to work out. It's hilarious to watch. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, we had a we were developing a product recently and someone says, Can you put a phone holder so people can like you know, push it up and down and they can film themselves doing it? And um and a guy in London actually, a, a boutique, and he said we we try and create like selfie stations where people can actually do that sort of stuff. It's built into the gym design. It is now. And, and, and part of it, you know, branding on mirrors and, and, and positioning it because, you know, there, there's also some liability there. Part of the problem when phones really started coming out to that degree and had the pictures and that started where people were doing that in the locker room, but there was some collateral damage yeah. in the background. Like, oh, my God, somebody's, you know, so now, you know, where do you put that? Do you create that environment, a step and repeat uh, uh, mirror with a with a hashtag and a logo or a, or a wall that's really a focal point where they can do that kind of mm. stuff. It is becoming part of design, and mm. if you do it right, it can be a really cool feature and a really good uh, uh, benefit for people to want to come to their gym because they want to look good. Yeah. Make sure that lighting is done right. You know, you've interviewed quite a, quite a few designers on this podcast, and lighting is really important. Do you make them look good, or do you put the funny mirrors from the carnival in there and make them look bad? You know, uh, but. You know, lighting is important. The environment is important. And if people are going to do that stuff, then create areas where they can do it and, and it makes your brand look good too. Yeah. Yeah, I think you either fight against it or you you embrace it. And, I, you know, whatever happens, you know, you, if you've got a few of the right people in your location, they could have hundreds of thousands of followers and they could be seeing your gym. And a lot of gyms, certainly, again, I talk about around here because I'm just familiar with it a little bit more, but... A lot of the popular gyms are popular because of some of the people that go into them and they've created almost like this cult status where now everyone goes there because they're there and it's a place to be seen. And, and so that, <laughs> and, and, and it is, and it basically took a, um, a philosophy that I've used for many years in gyms I've operated or consulted with. You know, we, we call it the fantasy 50 and, you know, not the fantasy in that regard, right? But, but it's almost like a fantasy football draft, you know, who are the top 50 people in your community, you know, that you, you want them to be at your gym. Who are they? Are they, you know, uh, police chief, mayor? Are there, there are people on TV that live in your community, actors, actresses, athletes, even local heroes that be, everybody knows? You want them at your gym. Well, nowadays, you take that same principle and you find those influencers and you go, I want them in my gym. And the internet makes it a lot easier because mm-hmm. typically you would go, oh, I saw so-and-so at the gym. Now I see him on the internet and I go, oh, if I go to the gym, I might see him too. And so there's a way to use it. It's just kind of taken that principle that I've always used and amplified it. And it's got to be done right. It's just like diet, right? Everything in moderation. Mm. There's a place for it and there's a great place for it. You just got to know how to use it. So I want to move on to sort of gym design. I know it's something sure. that your, you, you know, your other name is, uh, you know, aka the gym doctor. Health club doctor. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, health exactly. club doctor. Yeah. Health club doctor. Yeah. And, you know, a big part of that, you've, you know, we've been involved in developing some fantastic spaces. In fact, one of them, come on, tell me about what's, what's the, one of the biggest spaces that, um, that you did in um, on the, the one East in Long Coast. Island? Long Island, yeah. Yeah, that was a 40,000 square foot gym. That was from the ground up. It was a big project. Uh, fortunate enough to have a, an owner who really wanted to do something cool um, and wasn't afraid to take some, some chances. Uh, it took us a while to vibe together, but if you talk to him nowadays, we, we have we have an amazing relationship, and he had a great construction background. So that that project was a lot of fun because we just very much worked well together. Um, did I get him out of his comfort zone? Absolutely. You got me outside our comfort zone, to be honest. <laughs> but but, but uh, that space, when you walk into that space, it doesn't matter what the price is. Like everybody walks in and goes, "Shut up and take my money!" Like wow, and and. The impact from the street, the way it's lit at night, the glass, um, it's just awesome. And it's the, it was the right vibe for that market. Mm. Uh, big turf area in the middle. It's got a giant How jumbo How big was trunk. the turf? Turf was 35 feet wide by 100 long, something like that. And it's smack dead in the middle. It's got a mezzanine cardio deck. So when you look at it, 
when you're up there doing cardio, you can look out over the workout area or you can look out the windows, the big glass windows that, that overlook the, the town. Um, but when you're looking out over it, the turf is right in the middle. It's the hub of the activity, and there's a giant double-sided jumbotron uh, where we can, you know, we, we do a lot of advertising on it. Um, but we can also put promotional things for, for other events. Uh, we can do training there. Whenever there's a sporting event, they can put it on there. Um, but that gym, the, the weight room, the free weight room, is about 10,000 square feet alone. So how did you, like, doing that, you know, it was a statement. And I remember, even remember when Chris, who worked on this, um, got involved. And I'm like, gee, you know, someone's, someone's taking a big risk on this because it's, you know, like the, just the size and the investment to do it, it could have, it may not have worked, you know. Um, two, two things then, you know, one, how did you know that was going to work and was it as, as successful as what you'd planned that to be? Man, I'll tell you what, <laughs> successful, it, it, was, it was unbelievably successful and, and it still is. Prior to COVID, it, we were about to celebrate the one-year anniversary. Um, the one-year anniversary party was scheduled for, Mar- I think it was like March 21st. It opened on March 1st, 2019. And so the party was March 20-something, uh, 2020. And we had this big thing, and it, it was crushing it, absolutely crushing it. But on March 16th, the gym's the world shut down, right? So we, we never even got to celebrate that one one-year anniversary. Um, but... To give you an idea, we did so well with the pre-sale and the hype that we weren't, you know, a lot of people discount the pre-sale with zero enrollment and this and that. We were able to get almost full price during the pre-sale. And we did almost it was like 1,500 memberships at almost full price with enrollment fees and first month dues. And it was amazing because the building was going up and it was a beautiful place. We did a lot of great stuff on, on Facebook uh, and, and social media with creating the hype and, and whatnot. And it was a great... Uh, way to get the town involved uh, and we just made a lot of noise and it didn't cost us a lot of money from a marketing perspective to do it mm. we just did it the right way so when we opened those doors I mean it was it was something else and it was so, a st- I guess it's a statement in itself really it absolutely is and and uh, you know the the website what's the name for, of the club it, unique, fitness. unique fitness and that's the one in Holbrook if you go to uh, uniquefitnessgyms.com you can look at the, the Holbrook location but yeah, that was, that was really a statement inside the studios. Again, we talk about experience, right? And it's the same thing that I'm going to bring to the, to the world gym experience. When you can take people away from their problems, their stresses of life, and let them just forget about the world for a while and focus on themselves, you've got something. Which is why boutiques really did well, because they would go into these cool environments. and you know. But the beauty of having a big box gym, like a world gym, or unique in a sense, is we have the ability to be flexible as things change. We can take a space and modify that space in five years or seven years when maybe that trend is different. And we can do it really cool. You know? But if you're a boutique and you're stuck in what? You, are you going to survive for 10 years? I don't know. That's still, that's still to be mm. determined. But in this space, we created amazing boutique-like studios uh, that have your kid in it too, uh, but, but it just takes them away from everything else. So when they walk into Unique Fitness and they walk into this gym or that gym or that studio in, in the gym, you know, they forget about life for a while mm. and they get to focus on themselves and it's a really cool vibe. I know that, and we've had these conversations before, but, I, you know, gyms, gyms, fitness studios, whatever you want to call them, that the aesthetic has come on quite a long way. I know if you talk to Croco Black, he'll say that, you know, people are still trying to create gyms that look like hotels in some cases, which I, would, I wouldn't disagree with. But the, I think the design of the building, the carpets, the furniture have moved on. But although people say, oh, we've been innovative in terms of the equipment, which at the end of the day, that's kind of why a lot of people go in there is like the equipment. Um, it, it's still, I, I can't help going into a lot of even new gyms and thinking, well, there's not a lot different here. Like unique is, is unique. Um, but a lot of them are still, you know, very, very similar and traditional. What, what's your view on how that has evolved? Because if you look at what we spoke about earlier with the influencers, you know, there's certain things that they want to train and they want certain space to do things. And um, I, I guess, you know, how people interact with gyms has changed. 
Um, are you, when you're looking at these spaces, saying, well, look, we want to do something different, but how, how are you evolving that exercise experience in terms of the equipment, the layout, and the flow within a building? That's a great question. First of all, I want to say, Coco is a really good friend of mine. I, Coco Black, one of the best designers in, in the world, because he brings a different perspective to it. He's not afraid to be edgy. He's not afraid to be different, right? And, and design says a lot about who you are as a brand. You know, are, is everybody battleship gray? I mean, I don't know how many gyms you ever walk in and it's all battleship gray. You feel like you're in a submarine and it's like, where did that color come from, right? Don't be afraid to take some risks with that design. And that's what I love about him. But he also brings in a lot of cool features uh, and, and things that really make a statement. But that's also what it is. That vibe, that environment, people want to feel comfortable when they go there. And I, and I think that's where Planet, you know, did a job when they created that, you know, non-intimidation phrase and they tried to create the environment. Curves many years ago. You know, they, they no men, no makeup, no mirrors, come as you are. Like, they, they created an environment. It was simple, but it appealed to that market. So your design, and I'm not an interior designer. I'm by no means, you know, on the, on the level of a, of a Quoco and some of these other guys. But from my perspective, I want to take what a designer does and make it functional, right? It's almost like sometimes it can get a little carried away. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, man, who's going to clean that? Like, how's that going to work at the front desk? So with my experience in being in front-end operations and understanding the inner workings of a gym and what has to happen every day from, from being a trainer or a membership coordinator or an owner or a manager, I think about that day-to-day -day operation as well. And I think about, okay, well, my employees are the key part of creating a great experience. So I need to design a gym that makes it easy for my staff to do their job and deliver a great experience. And I think a lot of people miss that. What's the experience like for your staff to deliver great service? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, a missing link in, in some facilities. Is the desk big enough? Where's all the tools? How quickly can they get an answer to somebody? There's one phone. Well, if it's ringing, you got you know people doing it. Like, you got to think about those things. So I, I even go down to that detail. But when it comes to equipment, I take a different perspective. There's a lot of people who, and there's no offense to this, and this is not a shot at anybody, but there's brands out there, they sign deals with equipment companies, and the entire gym is one brand. Well, to me, that says, yeah, you got a great deal, but you didn't really think about your position in the marketplace. You didn't really think about your end consumer and getting the best of the best. So when I outfit a gym or a space, I really look at who am I going after? What am I really trying to achieve? What does everybody else have? Because, you know, in my mind, as much as I love the people in my industry, this is a business. So I go into an area and I want to dominate, right? I want to be the go-to place mm -hmm. if I'm positioning myself in that market. And that's what we're doing with World Gyms is we design and build the new ones. People are going to walk in and go, oh, yeah, I have to be here. And equipment plays a lot in that. I look for those innovative companies. I look for you know, functionality. And yeah, maybe they're not as mainstream as, as some of the big boys, right? Uh, but they offer a, a, a great product that not a lot of people want to spend the extra money on. And to be honest with you, I think that that's the problem with most American gym brands is they're so cost conscious. They don't put the same amount of effort into design. Mm -hmm. They don't want to pay for a beautiful floor like you see in Europe, you know, Poppy Gym out of Spain. It's, it's not the least expensive product in the world. It's a great product because but in America, people go, oh, that's too expensive. I don't want to spend that on my floor. What can I get for a dollar a square foot? Well, you know what I mean? It's the same thing in equipment. Well, how cheap can I get that? You're not thinking about it. Because I look at it as you're complaining that these other low-cost competitors are coming into your market and you're worth more to them. And you're trying to sell that exact same story to a consumer. Hey, we're worth more because we do it better. We do it experience. But yet you go beat up a vendor and go, yeah, I'm not paying that. That's too expensive for your product. You're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I like to position myself as, okay, what can I put in here that's going to be able to help me tell a story? It's going to solve some problems that my market has, and it's going to help me crush the competition. That's why I like cool products. And I'm not afraid to pay more for those products because I know they're going to be better and they're going to do me well in the long run. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people think about that when they design a gym. Do I get in a lot of fights with gym owners about their budget? Absolutely. They hate me. Um, but at the end of the day, what we deliver is exceptional. Mm.
And that's really what I hang my hat on. It, it's, it's an interesting point. And, you know, not, it, it, it can certainly come across from me as being biased. But, I, you know, we've worked with a lot of different companies, particularly, again, I'll use where I am in California uh, where, and, and New York as well. We've got some very interesting partners and distributors we work with. And um, when you take out, like, the, the traditional fitness industry, you know, fee-based clubs, that, that is very much the approach. And I get it, you know, they've got budgets to make and price points to hit and, and you've got to give those things some, some consideration. But, you know, I asked myself a question, well, well does, the, does the consumer care, you know? And I suppose if, obviously people who have not been in the gym, they probably don't and they don't know the difference. But I suppose people who do, you know, it's a question, well, would they notice if we did something different? And when I look at, some of the you know, corporate and particularly apartment complexes that go up very high end and they're trying to use the gym as a way to raise the rents and they're mm-hmm. trying to be able to say, well, look, we've got the best in here. It's, it's quite amazing how they're really leading. You know, if someone said, well, what's one of the most innovative gyms you see? I would say some of those are in apartment complexes because like the kit, you've probably got some of these brands that may not be quite as popular, but as someone who's worked out for 30 years, the, the kit actually is is really good equipment, um, you know, f- from a functionality or to do certain things. Now, maybe not one brand does all those pieces, but you can when you go into them, you think this is like a, you know, this is like a sort of a candy store. You know, it's amazing, and so I, I, it's an interesting conversation. And I wonder if, you know, some of those grey wall, very traditional one brand places will will have to evolve when you have people that are saying, well, look, this is going to be. I don't know what I can compare it to in, in another industry, but you know we've, had, we've got the best of the best. I've got a great story to tell, um, and this is really a, a great place to kind of get all the different ex- work, you know, fitness experiences. So I think you just identified the sneaky assassin for a lot of people, and that's these you know, uh, corporate and, and apartment-based fitness centers. They're starting to invest a lot more in them. <laughs> and you think about why a lot of people go to a gym or select a gym, it's convenience. You know, before it's like, okay, I took an apartment, a small apartment, I put a treadmill in there, I put a lift to go, there's a mat, and, but now they're creating some great spaces. And, and I think that a, a lot of our industry need to take note about how that's impacting some of their memberships and revenues and what they're doing. So the better they get at doing those spaces, that's, those are markets that we're going to have a hard time getting. Mm. Now, there's something to be said for how big is it, how many people it can get but they are willing to spend more money mm. on a better product. Even just from a visual standpoint, right? It's like there's a perceived value. When they see, you know, like I love with, with your kit especially, the bright colors, the color combinations, how easy it is from, you know, everything that's blue is going to be this way and green, and, and, it, and it makes a lot of sense. And when you walk in, it's visually appealing. Whether a person actually goes or not is one part of the battle. But if it, they're visually stimulated and it appeals to them and they go, wow. Here's my money. That, that's the first half, right? And I have to connect with them. And so sometimes spending more money on a product like that and creating a space like that takes away half the battle. They, they perceive a certain amount of value. Now I just got to get them to use it, which, mm. which is the other one. And as far as outfitting the gyms, I want the best of the best because I want to be able to have a story. And I think that that's the other problem. People buy things and think, oh, I just spent, you know, $10,000 on this piece of equipment, everybody's going to use it and come, and it sits in the corner and collects dust. Why? Because you didn't tell the story of why you got it. You, you did a bad job launching it. Did you make it exciting? Did you put balloons on it? Did you hold an open house? Do you have a trainer sitting there teaching people how to use it? Are you doing demos? Or did you just throw another piece of equipment on the gym floor? And when I do a gym, for me personally, every single piece has a purpose why I put a certain brand of treadmill in this gym versus that gym. Why am I going to use this type of functional equipment or why am I going to use that type of cardio or am I going to put this type of turf or this rig or rack? Everything is for a reason. And I think a lot of times we get so hyped up on, okay, I'm just going to outfit it. I get a price. You don't think about those things. And to me, that's a really, really big part of what I do. Mm. So one of the things that gets talked about a lot particularly recently, is the competition for um, digital fitness, which I know you've got a product, and I'll, I'll come on to that one. But, you know, pe- people now sort of invest in a lot in working out from home. Um, and, um, you know, certainly a lot of big brands that 
we're aware of, um, you know, they're still 50, 60 percent. They're not got everybody back yet. Now, right. what, what they're doing, who knows? But cer- certainly, if you look at the home equipment sales and people like Peloton and others, they're definitely helping people to create a very convenient and uh, fairly sort of supported um, experience from home. Um, what, what do you think, you know, in terms of where the industry is going? We talked about what some of these apartment complexes are doing. And it's interesting that certainly in America over, over the pandemic, that was one of the only sectors that stayed extremely buoyant. You know, they were still building mm-hmm. gyms and building apartment um, complexes, very nice gyms. You know, where do you think the competition is going to come from? And, and what do you think in general, the traditional industry that we all know, um, need to do to to also stay relevant or to or to or to you know to lead in in some respect so this is definitely uh a still to tbd right just to see how hybridization that that whole word which is another you know new normal hybridization <laughs> like all these things is driving me nuts um but i don't think any digital experience will ever fully replace that human interaction just don't see it. We have a need as people to be around other people. So what's why the gym is great. You know, people join gyms, they, okay, they want to lose weight or look different. Okay. That fine. But they also join because they want to have fun and they also want to be around other people. Now, whether they tell you that or not, you can see it eventually over time. They interact on the social media pages, they do different things, but at the gym, being around people that vibe, that energy, a group class at home in your living room, when you're Okay, cool, you got that vibe. But when, when they're in a studio and the music is pumping and the lights are going and you see that instructor on the stage, you know, you want her butt, her arms, her energy, her, her whatever, and you're just vibing off of that. You can't replace that. Now, can it be used as a supplement for when I'm traveling? Can it be used as a lead-in for perhaps corporate memberships and corporate wellness programs? Can it be used as a save for those on freeze or whatever? Yeah, I, I see a place for that digital model, which is why we invested so much in World Gym Anywhere uh, and, and are doing some really cool things with it. But I don't see that being the main competitor moving forward. I, I, I think that you watch the end of this year. I really feel like Q4 and Q1 of 2022 are just going to be amazing uh, statistics coming out of our fitness industry. Because we were booming in 2019. We were as an industry, we were rocking. Mm. We were set to do some great things. But I think after people get a little bit of the travel out of the way this summer, they've come out of their homes, right? They've got some things. Kids are actually going to start going back to school, it seems, in most areas. People are going to have to start going back to work in a lot of areas as well. The gym is going to become that, that's, that haven again. Mm. And I think you're going to see a lot of people who once left go, I need to get back there. And they might not come seven days a week like they did before, but they're going to come back. Mm. One, one of the groups that uh, seems to be doing really well, which isn't one that if I'd have had to put money on it, you know, as we were in the middle of a pandemic, I wouldn't have done it. But the boutiques um, seem to be coming out of it really, really well. You know, I, I saw some of the numbers on, on SoulCycle and there's a number of people I know that have got them and they're, they're really thriving. And I, I, I suppose... And I, I think I think even had conversations with people saying, well, you know, those are the guys that are going to get hit hard because hit they've got high rents and, you know, it's just one model. But I'd be interested to your view, you know, do you think that's because these guys are really focusing on what you said, this experience? And people are like, look, I, I just want to have a great experience. And that's why those seem to be, uh, you know, very successful as we come out of this. Yeah, you know, experience to me is the word. Boutiques disrupted the industry because that's what they did. They took one thing, they focused on it, and they made it just an awesome experience. Like, when you think about Orange Theory, okay, circuit training like that, a high-intensity training's been around a long time. Epoch, the thing that they promote, right, they took a very scientific term that's been around for a long time in the training world, and they made it sexy. They gave it a great story. They gave it a great workout. They... They created a space and energy and did, you know, and so that's why those boutiques really started disrupting the industry because gyms were slow to adopt that mindset. It's like build it and they will come this big open space and throw a lot of equipment in it and put these certain types of lights and, and yeah, they're just going to pay me money. But boutiques are exactly an argument to my point. People are willing to pay better for that type of experience. Now, again, 
are they going to be around long term? And when I say long term, 20 plus years, you know, let me know when those boutiques are 45 years, <laughs> because that's what I, I want to see them do that. Mm. And, and they're, they're good for our industry in the sense that they've created some innovating programming. They've helped big box gym guys think differently. And I love that. And, and to me, that's all about being a, a, a legacy brand over time. We have to continually reinvent that experience, but stay true to who we are. And I think boutiques can really help a business, especially a big box business, look deeply at themselves and going, am I satisfied with status quo? Or am I willing to make some investment and take some risk, calculated risk, and do things differently? And that's including a hybrid model. That's thinking about how I can partner with the apartment complex that's going up as the official gym provider instead of them putting a gym inside do i head that off at the pass right so do, can i get creative in the way i do business and can i meet people where they are and so that's really important to me as we move forward how do we how do we do these things and so my mind is always clicking on that stuff mm-hmm. I, you know three o'clock in the morning you have that bright idea and i'm like god oh, i i gotta put that down somewhere you know and um there's a lot of great ideas that come in at two or three in the morning just yeah. not on the street but mm-hmm. I mean, when you're when you're thinking you know so I know prior to you being involved in, in Worlds um, that you know your group were considering going into that boutique space, um, I believe. Oh. What, what was the reason uh, for your brand that wasn't the right direction? So, uh, you know, again, you look at who you are and where you want to go. And so, you know, we, we created a program called World Gym Athletics, and the, and the original idea was that maybe this was going to be our new smaller model, right? Seeing the success, and, and again, this is one of the things about the fitness industry. Sometimes people get caught up in, the, in that, you know, follow the herd mentality, mm-hmm. right? Oh, everybody's doing it, so I got to do it too. Um, price, equipment, wh- whatever it is. And, and this was one of them. So when you look at boutiques, everybody says, well, i got to have a boutique model. Mm-hmm. And the thought process I could understand, mm-hmm. but it wasn't the right fit for who we were. We came in and really looked at what, what the investment was and did it make a lot of sense. It didn't make sense for it to be its own standalone, but it did make sense for it to continue to be signature programming for World Gym. And as we move forward now, World Gym Athletics is our signature programming. You know, and it, it, it's something that has evolved now to a very, you know, scientifically backed three-phase training program. We could say it's, you know, designed for the everyday athlete to get you stronger and fitter, faster than ever before. And when you tell that to somebody, they go, wait, what? Really? What? And it leads to a conversation. And so now as we move forward, every world gym has this great signature program that we can wrap a story around and create value to. And it doesn't have to be a standalone. Mm. It can be right inside the big box of who we are and what we do. We've just now evolved to create a, a different experience inside our original box. That's so we're excited about it. Yeah, I, I bet. I, like, I've seen the, the standalone. And, and you know, I must admit, seeing how well it was done and, um, and as a concept, you think, wow, th- this is great. You could see these all over the place. Um, but understanding what you've said um, from a business perspective it's like well who who are we and and I, I guess that must take that must have taken quite a bit of courage because you, you know you would get excited I, I got excited about it and I, I you know many people that I know would see it and say yeah you know you could imagine these all over the place but yeah you know it must have taken courage and and I suppose was that a difficult decision to say no let's just look we are a big box let's put it in there and make that a, a part of a bigger story? It was hard for, for some to grasp the concept because it's like, man, we just made this huge investment. And when I came in and I said, you know, yeah, I, I understand that you made a huge investment, but it may not have been the right investment, right? And so when you look at it, it wasn't right for, for who we were as World Gym. Mm-hmm. It, it, was, it was going away from from what we do and what we're known for. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want a complete brand shift, I get that. But to me, that wasn't the right way to do it. Now, are we tweaking our models in the future to have maybe some smaller scales, really serious gyms? Yeah, we, there's going to be some great things coming for us, as, as you see, in 2021 and 2022. Um, but a standalone, boutique-y style, 
single focus only studio is not who we are and what we do. And so we took the core component of it, which was the programming, and we evolved it and really created something special with it. And now can make that a core component of our big boxes. And it, and it seems to be working very well right out of the gate. So mm. we're excited about where it goes in the future. So with programming, I know post-pandemic, it's definitely here in America. I'm not quite sure what it's like in other parts of the world, but traveling, you know, there's certainly, whether it's hotels, Ubers, restaurants, gyms, there's, there's a big demand for services, but there doesn't seem to be the ability from a staffing perspective to support that demand mm. at, at a high level. Um, with, I guess, you know, your boxing box concept and other other brands out there, you know, do you, do you see that being a challenge for the industry to sort of get those, that, 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 you know, those high level trainers to, to not only develop, but to li- deliver that experience? Or do you think that's gonna be a challenge for some time, you know, with a, a shortage of people? Being able to do that. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I look at that. There is obviously a shortage of people right now. We, we, we can sit here and have a whole different conversation and podcast on why we think that is, right, which would be entertaining <laughs> uh, in itself. But there's actually an opportunity right now for a lot of people who were stuck in a career that they hated to take a chance on making fitness a second career. You know, and I, and I, and I look at it and go, if you're one of those people at home going... I really hate my job. I don't want to drive back to the office. I don't want to sit there five days, but I really love the gym. Take that risk. Now's a perfect time. You know, I've never prescribed the fact that you have to have a degree or some sort of high education to be successful. I don't have a degree. I got to where I am. I don't have a degree, but I have education. I have hard work. I put myself in a position. There's a lot of great people out there that have made fitness their second career in the second half of their life. And are doing really well. And I think that if we can start to promote that as an industry, I think we can start to develop our own talent. You know, because sometimes you inherit bad, you know, bad habits and this and that. Oh, I've been around the industry for a while. Maybe I don't want that anymore. Maybe I want somebody that I can teach and mold and grow into positions. Mm. So for me, I'm looking for those people right now. You know, if you want to do something different, you want to start a new career, great. Come to World Gym. We're going to train you up. We're going to give you a path and... We're going to see what we can do moving forward. Or open your own gym and we'll help you do that too. Yeah. You know, um, Is staffing a challenge? Yes. Is there going to be a need for more digital maybe inside the gym? I think right now you know, some of those on-demand classes to fill the role of a, of a group exercise instructor, traditionally female for the most part, right? A group ex, traditionally female, a lot of times their moms or have other jobs and it's a part-time gig for them. Um, and now life has changed this last year. Some of them got used to being home more. You know, teaching as much as they love it is not as much of a priority. We have to fill those gaps. Revenues are down, right? And so can I still offer a group exercise experience and not have the payroll? So again, these are a lot of the things that we're all working through as an industry. Mm. Um, But I do think great challenges bring great opportunities. And right now, all of us have a great opportunity to think differently, do differently, and be differently. And I, and I think that those who do are going to set themselves up for great success in the years to come. Fitness definitely has the, the price of getting fit or going to gyms has definitely continued to, to come down. And I suppose when you talk about good quality staff, the industry is not known to be great payers either, is it? You know, and, and I suppose attracting people that you know, talented people when the pay is not there. And I know in some of the boutiques there are exceptions, but I, I suppose that's a bit of a challenge. In order to, to, you know, experience is about people at the end of the day. It's a big part of it. Um, how, how do you think that will pan out? Do you, do you think that, you know, things will need to rise for a better experience so that we can pay for good people and people that want to invest in themselves or their companies to be able to, provide, whether it's the knowledge, the expertise, the entertainment that's required. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a big problem um, because, you know, obviously payroll and rent, right? They're your, your two big overhead or payroll and mortgage, depending on whether you own the, the property. And payroll can get out of control really, really fast. So in an effort to control those costs, right, what do people do? Oh, they cut or they pay minimum wage or, you know, they go, oh, well, I want my, my front desk staff to 
you know, I'm going to hire a harpy. If you got a car and you can put on a shirt and you can show up at 4 a.m., you know, you're at the desk. And for me, I think even just the term front desk just brings it down a level, right? This is when you go to a hotel like this, you're warmly welcome. It's a reception area, right? It, we're really in the hospitality industry. We deliver a service to people. Our service, our widget happens to be fitness. So why are we looking down upon our staff to, to say that we, you don't deserve to get paid a certain level, right? We just want minimum wage workers. Mm. Now, is there a place for that? Yeah, it's a great starting job. But what are we doing to help them advance in their career? Are, we, I see it all the time. People go, oh, I have terrible employees. Really? Or are you just a really bad employer? Meaning you don't, <laughs> you don't have systems and processes to train these people or provide them success. Maybe your HR isn't set up in a way that you attract a better quality employee. So I really want people to, to look at and revisit their comp plans. We're actually doing that now with our, our gyms and our HQ gyms. Like, let's deconstruct this thing and look at how do we attract and maintain a better level employee to make them really feel engaged and part of the team, feel like they have a career path moving forward. And when you empower your people, what happens? They take care of your members, right? It's like what Richard Branson always says, my, my main focus is my employees because they're the ones who are taking care of my customers. And I subscribe to that, that thought process. And I think that we need to do a better job as a whole, as an industry on taking care of our people and investing in them and, and making sure people know that this could be a great career. Mm. And sometimes we're our own worst enemy. We get caught up in that payroll, 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 payroll. Yeah, but if I invest a little bit more, I can cover that cost because I'm going to keep more people. I'm going to sell more memberships or retail or training or whatever it is. Mm. Um, and so, again, think different, be different, do different. Do you think, I like that, by the way. Uh, is that your statement? Well, it's one of them. I, I, <laughs> I, one, my CEO tells me I'm, not, I'm a tagline master, even though I don't have a mark. But, but yeah, I have a lot of little isms that I work with. So, so with the with just finishing off on that pricing. So, y- if you look at whether it's boutiques or training studios, which uh, again around here, uh, there's a, there's a lot of that type of model opening up again. People are paying way more than what they would do to go into a gym and get all those different services. Um, and you know, boutiques have done a great job of getting new people in. But do do you think that that there is an opportunity for more of the mid-market big boxes to actually charge probably more of a fairer rate for what they're delivering. Because if you if you look at the price to go to, let's say, a soul cycle, considering you just get, you know, I'm not a, you know, spinning or whatever, you, you group cycling, yeah. Um, yeah. you pay a lot of money for that. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that that's wrong whatsoever, but you pay a lot of money that cons- compared to if I wanted to come into somewhere like your gym and have in fact i went into one when it was closed i went to your outdoor space not far from here and uh and it was pretty cool it was a quite a great experience that there was there was even though it was partly open there was a lot to do for the price that you were charging and and there's there's definitely seems to be an imbalance and and the best instructors tend to gravitate to those because they get paid pretty well from from what i understand um do, do you think there's a sort of a, a balancing that could happen, um, which would mean that those, you know, business, and I know there's exceptions as well in that space, but I'm just interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a great opportunity in the big box world in that mid-price market, which is where we're going to be playing. We're a big box gym. We're, we're not going to be playing in that low price area. We're going to be moving it upward. We're, we're going middle and upward and providing a great experience at a, at a fantastic price. Um, but to that, how we attract and maintain top level talent to do that, there's other ways to compensate people. It's not just about the dollar amount. Think about fitness professionals. They have to keep up certifications and educate. That costs money. Mm-hmm. There's value in what we provide to any instructor or trainer that works at World Gym. They have free CEUs and CECs for the rest of their career as long as they stay with World Gym. So maybe our owners can't pay them X, Y, and Z, $70 a class. But maybe they're in the ballpark for that area. But then a perk like that makes a big difference to them. So to me, there's other ways to compensate employees and, and have that better quality instructor uh, than just a dollar amount. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, at the end of the day, everybody's got to pay their bills and, and do their thing. 
Uh, but I think there's a way to, to balance it out mm. and still make sure that you have top-level top talent uh, in a big box like ours. And that's going to come with a great facility, a great studio. You know, how well, ma- how well do you maintain it? Is it clean? You know, instructors are looking for how much you invest in their space, too. Same with the trainer. It goes back to equipment. Do they have all the toys to do the job that they need to do? Or are they stuck with the same five gyms with the same five treadmills and the same dumbbells? And, you know, a weight is a weight, okay? How it's coded is different. I get it. How it bends, okay, fine. But at the end of the day, as a trainer, I'm looking for a home that I can get people results because that's my bread and butter. And if my gym is better equipped, if it's well-maintained, if it's laid out the right way and it's a cool vibe and I can do what I do best in that environment, that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. So again, I think there's ways to attract better talent and it's not just about what you pay them. Mm. And what about, where where do you think the sort of, um, the digital space plays into that or integrates into that? You've got your product, you're working with Gunner, um, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, obviously one of the, you know, certainly one of the top trainers out there. How, how do you how do you sort of see the because there's a lot of people that went into the digital space when the pandemic happened and threw a lot of money at it and realized probably it was a lot more difficult than what they thought. Uh, the technology, the, the the you know creating the content, the people to put the content together, the distribution of the content. There's there's a lot there and. I've not met many people that have made um, a huge amount of money. In, in fact, a lot of people seem to lose a lot out of it. So what, what's your view on, on digital? And, and you know, do, do you see there being a slightly different way of, you know, obviously it's here to stay, but do you, do you see that, that the relationship between a bricks and mortar and a digital business kind of evolving? Yeah, so w- with our platform, um, you know, first of all, one of the cool things about World Gym Anywhere is being a truly global brand, right? We're in 17 different countries. And being world gym, when we sat down and thought about what could make our hybrid model or our digital offering more unique, is being able to have content from all of our world gyms around the world. So the goal with World Gym Anywhere is to have our own instructors from Taiwan and Russia and Australia and the US and Canada creating content for a truly global experience. So, you know, you can, we're, we're one brand, yeah, but we're also one family, so it would be really cool. You could get addicted to taking a class with an instructor in Australia, you know. Um, but the cool thing is seeing their own local instructors mm-hmm. on this app. Because, again, there, there's that, that feeling of, of humanity that we talk about, that human interaction. Oh, that's my, my small instructor, Joe, or you know, Nancy or whatever, I take her class all the time. Now I can do it when I'm on vacation with my kids. You know, it's a really cool thing. Uh, so I think, again, positioning the right way is really important. Third-party partnerships like a Gunnar Peterson. Um, you know, we, we have a partnership with Soul Body right now and, and Les Mills and some other content providers to provide that variety. All that's great, but it stinks if you can't use it, mm-hmm. right? And, and you can't make it work. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with. How do we make this a core offering? How do we this integrate this into what we do and who we are without taking away so much focus that we stop focusing on our, our core business? To me, we're, there's opportunities to use it. I think I mentioned earlier, you know, some corporate membership potential. Um, upsells in, in higher dollar memberships. Hey, look, if, if you're a membership model that has tiers, you know, one of the ways to increase value is yeah, as long as you know you're you're this type of membership, you get the on demand or the, you know the digital offering, um, using it for people that are, are frozen. Uh, there's a whole database right now around the world of canceled gym members. I would be hitting that all day long with my digital offering. Like stay connected to us as a brand, mm. you know. And so we're positioning it to use that as as an additional asset. Do you think it's not kind as of a also thing that carries us a bit like a marketing? in some way as a, as a marketing exercise to, you know, have, create that community and conversation, but, you know, being in control of the content in some, some way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and anything you can do to get your name out there, right? That, that's the name of the game is market share, right? Get seen, get visible. And you open up your phone, people got hundreds of apps and this and that. And, and, you know, if it's priced reasonable, people have these apps on their phone that they pay for that some of them don't even use. Mm-hmm. But if I've got my app on there and every time they scroll a page, they see my World Gym logo, that's brand recognition. You know, and so 
Do I want them to use it? Yeah, I do. But I want to stay top of mind mm -hmm. more yeah. than anything. And if I can meet them where they are, at home, at work, at school, at play, you know, in the gym, you win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very competitive space, but I think, you know, looking at it from a revenue perspective or a branding, I think that's, it sounds like a smarter way of looking at things, even though there's a significant cost of being able to deliver it. It's, um, yeah, I, I get the, uh, I get the benefit of that. There's a few brands I've been to and, you know, they're, I, I stay in touch with them through some of those areas, yeah. not necessarily that I'd pay, but you know, I keep, keep their app on my phone. Yeah, and, and I, I, our national director of group fitness, she's been amazing at putting you know, World Gym Anywhere together. I think she has like 30 different fitness apps that she pays for, just from a research perspective, <laughs> but also because she likes that variety you know, mm. and, and, and whatnot. And there's a lot of people out there that like that variety which is why I still go back to the big box philosophy, right? Because there's some people that have these boutique memberships, but if you don't feel like doing that workout that day, you can't just go move in the mm -hmm. studio. You can't just go do a recovery session or foam roll or jump on a treadmill and maybe you're not feeling your best, right? And you can't do that work. You can't, so now I need another membership and then maybe another membership, you know, that's why I still think the big box is here to stay. Mm. You know, we, we are looking forward to really growing and developing that as we move forward we've got some really cool things going for it and and man that hybrid part that digital space is going to supplement what we do but it's also going to match who we are mm. and i think that, again another important point don't lose yourself in, in trying to find yourself <laughs> so you, you know year in you've obviously made you know from what i understand you made some interesting changes um what what's what what are you planning next? Obviously, there's some stuff that I'm sure you can and can't share, but you know, based on what you can share, where, where, do you, where would you like to sort of see things go next, whether that's from a product perspective or a market perspective or innovation? What, you know, what's, what's next for World Gym? Yeah, so you know, we've, we've done some great things, as you mentioned, over the, over the last year. I mean, we're, we're one of the brands that were playing offense you know, in, a, in a world that was playing defense this last year. I'm really proud of that. That doesn't mean we had huge amount of growth, but we were reinvesting in the company and bringing in new employees at the corporate level to, to really look at our systems and processes and what we deliver. And, and I think to me, I'm, I'm very proud of that, you know, uh, that we were able to commit to, to that reinvestment in a, in a time where a lot of that wasn't going on. Um, but all of that leading up to launching the new version of World Gym. And we're really excited about the things we have in the pipeline for that, uh, from the look and feel, the design, uh, you know, from the message that we, we declare and that we want to send to the public. Um, and, and we're really excited about those things. And then we've got a couple cool things on the horizon. You know, World Gym Athletics was just one, you know, focus of programming as we move forward, as, as we start to do some, some other things in, inside the gyms and create these spaces. It's going to open up opportunities to expand that portfolio of programming that's really going to set World Gym apart from, from others. Um, and at the same time, you know, we've got our, our eyes set on, you know, getting back to, to, to the top tier, you know, gym brands that we're 45 years. We should be mentioned there. You know, we, we had our, we had our time where we, we fought through some things, but we've overcome that perseverance, right. You know, uh, which is great. Um, and we're still here, but now what we've got ready to go. We're pretty excited, and the world should be excited too. So, you, a thousand gyms best. in the next ten years total. I, I, I think you're gonna you're gonna see that. Excellent. So, final question then, Jared. Escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a memorable example of you escaping your own personal limits? Uh, <clears throat> I think for me personally, one of the things I always heard was when I wasn't going to college. You, you know, you're, you're, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You're never going to get anywhere. You're going to be stuck. I was training at 17 and everyone, my client, you got to go to college. You got to go. You got to go. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to do a different path. And I think that, you know, mindset of, hey, you got to have this higher education or you got to do that, which I'm not talking against. I think that really motivated me to get out of my own head. Like this, this world has said, you got to be this person. And you got to follow this course to be who you want to be or to be successful. And for me, getting out of my own head 
with blocking out all of those noise has just allowed me to do things I never thought were possible. And I think that has actually fueled me, and it's why I love the podcast so much, because I, I look at limits as, well, that's my next goal. <laughs> and when I get to that one, I'm going to the next one. And so I, I, I'm just going to keep looking for that next challenge, and that's what really drives me. I, I, there's no limit that I'm not going to take head on for the rest of my life, whether it's work, family, sports, whatever it is. Um, and I think that that was one of the biggest things I ever had to do was, was break that mold of who the world wanted me to be to become the person that I am today. And I, and I look at that and it drives me every single day. Fantastic. Well, Jared, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Matthew. Good luck with everything it. in the future. Thank Thanks. you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.